I'm going to do a little bit of painting on the trees first to kind of give them a little bit of shade because right now they're they are pretty flat looking. I'm going to switch to a different brush. And I want to clean up my maple's yellow so it doesn't have that green quality to it. My yellows are especially this yellow, the primary yellow, is usually the one that gets contaminated the most. It's never a true primary yellow. I'm always going into it with something else. But since I had Naples yellow up in the foliage area, I'm going to use that as a start in, in some of my, to start to round out my tree. And I want a variety. I just don't want to come down the side with, with this shape and not have it be a variety of shapes. And I want to kind of round it out. This tree is behind that one, so I'm going to edge that with a little color. So I'm going to put a little bit of that yellow family on each tree. Obviously, my sunlight's coming in from this direction, so the right side for me is the shadow side. And this tree's behind that one, so I'm going to put that in there right away so I remember that one's behind because it's smaller and it starts further back. All those little simple little spatial things we need to take into consideration. So I want that to be darker there. I'm just going to skip that part. Although I'll probably have a little bit of definite darker color through there. Okay. Oh, so you need a little bit more up on this one. I missed that. And this tree is in front of that one, so I'm going to give myself that information. That branch is in front by putting color behind it. And this tree is in front of that one, so I'm going to add a little bit of pigment there, too. And that branch is in front of that one. I could maybe do a bit of that out. Flat brush that's not too long of a fiber, a shorter fiber flat brush really gets you to lift color out nicely. We're lifting color, you're saying? Lifting. Lifting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to lift that yellow out of there because right. that branch is coming from here, which is in front of that one. That's why it's good to start with yellow. It's like an almost color. It's almost a color, especially Naples yellow, because there's already white in the Naples yellow, so it's it's opaque as well as cerulean blue. There's white in cerulean blue, so. But I could not live without those two colors. Okay, so, now that I've got yellow on there, let's go with one of my favorite colors, Avignon Orange, which the My Mary Company, that I use mm -hmm. My Mary Paint, they just reformulated and renamed their paints. Remember, it was Tiziano Red for Quinacridone Coral, and it was always, you know, fans of blue for Invinthrone Blue. And it was like, well, what is this color? Well, they've started to name them a little bit what they actually are. And I knew from experience that uh, Aven what they called Avignon Orange was an old-fashioned mm -hmm. color by the name of, of Brown Matter Alizarin, oh, yeah. oh, wow. oh. which is gorgeous. Brown Matter Alizarin. So I'm going to start with a little bit more definition here. <clears throat> so I like to put color down, then I like to kind of manipulate it, maybe soften some of the edges. <coughs> Maybe give it a little bit more information for the viewer as to how that shape
shadow is working and the scoring. Let's come across to this big one. So I cleaned off my brush and now I'm just going to kind of manipulate that paint a little bit. And I don't want it to be so regimented. I want it to be a variety of textures and line qualities. Push that tree behind the other one. Now that pops out more because we've got a stronger value there. Now if I had painted these trees with the casein, I would need to wait until that's dry, really good and dry, before I would put any more paint on it to kind of round it out. I always have my paper toweling and I only use Viva. I always sound like a Viva commercial, but it, it's, it's more like fabric and it doesn't leave any design. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, like Bounty or one of those. Yeah, and it really, um, it really absorbs nicely and doesn't leave any lint behind. It's, it's really the best for, for watercolor. Do you always stand and paint flat? I do. I do. I, I, I see a lot of people like this. Never do I do that. I always work flat. I, it's, it's just, well, yeah. Um, at home, my, my table is this high, though. Yeah, it's, it's this high. Yes. Can you hold it up one? Sure. So far. Okay. So far, we got to get some blues in those um, aspen trees. <laughs> I wanted to get this warm tone down first because everything's pretty cool in this so far with, with my color choices. So. I wanted to warm it up with some of the red. Oh, for tomorrow's class, I, I think some of you are probably here that are going to be taking the class tomorrow with me. Mm -hmm. um, what, what we originally thought we would do is everybody would work on, bring in their own reference photo and work from that. But since the class grew to the size that it is, we, I decided that it would probably be best that we all work on the same project. So what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to do a homework ahead of time, and I'm going to um, make an illustration that we're going to copy off tomorrow, and then um, everybody will kind of be working on the same thing. And I, I just think that will really help things along rather than me having to jump from, okay, now you've got this guy, but you've got that tree there. You know, it, it, too many variables. So I think for a class with the size that we got, it's going to be the most effective way to, and you want to, to meet everybody's sheet? needs. You want to yep, we'll work sheet? on a half a sheet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, this is a little smaller. I cut this down about a couple inches, so. And we can get those here. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. I think I've got paper left over. So look at, I'm just kind of smushing this in here. It really looks like a hot mess right now. Oh, I went over my branch. I'm gonna lift that out now. Oh, I might have to use my casein there. It might have stained. Do you worry about whether you're using staining or non-staining colors? No, nope, I do not. <coughs> not at all, because I just want the color. 
And mostly the staining colors are the, um, the phthalos, the primary colors, so, which I do have on my palette. They're part of the Perfect 12, so of course I have them. And we'll be talking a lot about color theory tomorrow as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to smush that one together, and then I'm going to go for some blue. And I'm going to use that same cerulean blue. I'm not going to switch to another one. Notice how this tree further back, it doesn't have quite a, the intensity of the, the colors on the other ones. It's a little bit more muted because it's farther away. All right, okay, now let's grab that cerulean blue again. And I've got a yellow and a red on there, don't I? Mm -hmm. So if I add blue, we might get some neutralization somewhere, but I still have a lot of white showing as well. So I might get some true cerulean blue, which would be nice for the sky to kind of redo that, introduce that too. So let's go into this. See how that's just gonna kind of Neutralize a bit. Oh, true, true color there. And I don't want to cover all that yellow. I do want some of that to, to show up. this red and this brown steel to grain to the bottom of this one because a lot of birch trees or aspens they have a really dark base and add a little bit of cerulean blue to it there's enough red in there that it would neutralize just to kind of give it a little something different mm -hmm. I'm going to skip this right here right now because it's too wet, it would, it would bleed over. So I'm going to wait a bit on that one. It's, oh, I will hold it up for you. Absolutely. It's still kind of a mess. It's not fine-tuned yet at all, that's for sure. Thanks, Joy. Okay, so a liner brush or a rigger, um, they have a longer fiber than, than a number six. So you can see it's longer and it's skinnier, and you can really flick it. And I want them to go every which way. And then they also have some very interesting things that they have their little knots. They kind of look like eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Dab some up a little bit so they're not quite so perfect looking. <laughs> and sometimes it is good to go into the area when it's still wet because then you do get a fuzzy edge and it's kind of fun to have that. So then I kind of look at my strokes that I've created with going down the tree to round it out and then I use some of those as my ideas as to how I can make all these knots and scores and all those little rough edges that happen. And it's kind of like these, these lines that I'm putting on, this calligraphy line, it's kind of like how a lighthouse would work. How when you're looking straight on it, they're straight, but then as it goes up, they go this way, and as it goes down, they go this way. So it all depends on your perspective as to how, how those are going to be placed.
What's your favorite thing to paint? Well, I was Let's just asked that her. last night, too. Um, you know, it's, I, I really cannot say. I just love it all. So that's why I'm kind of all over the place with, with what I do, because I, I just, I, I don't want to be pigeonholed into doing one thing. Okay, so I'm going to squirt out a good amount of the casein on my palette. And since I've got that warm color in there and I only have it on the trees, I want to have some more warm color within my foliage that's going to be down in front. See how I just drag, drag right in it and mm -hmm. grab it. So that's an interesting, and I still have my little splatters of white on there too that I've saved with the masking fluid. Might be quite so. But see how with the mm. darkness. What did you mix that with? What's that? What did you mix that with? Uh, that Avignon orange or brown matter alizarin, the Thank same you. color I used in my trees. And it turned into a really nice pink, so you can see how much red is in that particular paint. But I don't want to use it throughout. I just want to kind of give it a little bit of something here and there, specifically to hide the base of those trees. So I'm going to use this value up, and then I'm going to mix some more, maybe using some other color. And those are like flowers, like little, little Yeah, or things. foliage of some kind. So if I have a darker paint along the background, you can see how it's showing up mm -hmm. because I've got something dark behind it. So that's why I wanted to get a more saturated pigment down below here. I could have even gone way darker than that too. So I'm just kind of dabbing it on. I don't want to fill in all of that beautiful color that I have, but I do want to build it up in a variety of areas with this value, because then I'm going to change it and I'm going to add a little bit more pigment to it and change it up. Mm -hmm. See how that really, it's so dense. It really muddies up the water quickly <laughs> because it, it's very, very potent. Okay. So now I think I'm gonna go in with, I should maybe go in with some yellow. Let's grab a little bit of yellow. Why do you rub your brush against your? To, to clean it off. Oh, yeah, some people do this, the mm -hmm. and, and then it splatters all over, yeah. so I just do it next to the side because it, it cleans it off better, and I never do that because I might splatter somebody <laughs> else's painting, so there's a lot of reasons why. And never leave your brushes soaking oh, in no. your <laughs> soaking in your bucket of water. That's the quickest way to, to lose a brush. I'm going into that quinacridone gold. So if you had a sponge, you could stick a sponge in there to get a nice irregular little burst. That would look lovely as well. Like yeah, it's got some body to it, absolutely. Yeah, you can see it on my brush how, how juicy it is. It's bulky, for sure. So did the contest work? You sold a lot of product? He did, <laughs> and it, it introduced it to a lot of people, too. Right. And an, another element that, that it has, um, if you were to let it dry and then take take a soft cloth, you can buff it. You can rub it, rub it, rub it, and it kind of seals it, 
and it creates a really pretty, um, like a sheen to it. It's, it's very interesting, interesting stuff. So I'm not covering up all of that pink I did. I'm, I'm just kind of introducing it here and there. Of course, this has got to have some definite, I'm gonna put some down in tier two. I don't want that going right off the bottom. I didn't like it at first at all. It's the happiest birch woods I've ever seen. What's that? It's the happiest birch wood I've ever seen. Oh, well, that's good. Happy, happy trees. <laughs> so this, the bottom of this one needs to be disturbed too. And I might even go into here with some greens. I'll mix up a green next and see what we get gives you an idea of the range of what you can get when you use it. And this is a number 10 that I'm using, but it's got a really, really nice tip on it so I can get some interesting little, little dots and dabs happening. What time of year would this be? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's spring. Mm -hmm. I think it's, that's a good question because the, the wildflowers are coming out and no branches, you know, no leaves on the branches or anything like that yet. So I think it's more of a spring scene. That's what we'll say it is. <laughs> it's almost abstract. <laughs> yeah, it's got, yeah. And obviously I could really firm this up and make it more of a true, you know, back in my studio, a true realistic looking painting. I definitely could do that. But I like to start paint things like this anyway because I might want to leave it at this yes, level yes. and not take it to total reality. So let's grab a little bit of. But it seems to me to be what's more popular she is with judges now. Something that's creative. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I do have up here some of the. This is the um, TWSA show I was in. Some of the more Rocky Mountain National, some of the Louisiana watercolor, um, some of the more recent shows I've been in. Look through these and see what's happening in the watercolor world. It just blows you away. All of the, I mean, from soft and subtle to just so vibrant. And then I have a couple articles I got a, on a magazine, one of my paintings. Um, this was actually a poured painting, believe it or not. That was a, more of a controlled poured painting. I saw that lady walking across the street in San Miguel, and I had my um, my iPhone and um, snapped her. And oh, that is a pretty color too. So what green did you put? I just put some Hooker's green into this whole mess that I've got going. <laughs> So no one's really used the, the casein much around here, huh? I've never heard of it. Really? Okay. Well, maybe we'll introduce some of that tomorrow in oh, class. <sighs> and I do have another painting up here I can share with you. Um, this is all watercolor. Oh, here it is. Forget the red dot there. <laughs> um, that's the sun, right? So um, this is all watercolor, except for all of the all of this down here is the casein. So exactly like how I am doing for you today, that gave me that that foil at the bottom where I could create, you know, things going back into there. So I'm just going to go a little bit farther on this and and. Does anybody have any questions? Joy, is that a water medium then? It is. It's considered part of the water media family. Absolutely. But you still have to categorize it as mixed. Media. As mixed media. Absolutely. Okay. So in some some competitions won't even, you know, accept it unless it is a multimedia, a mixed media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, transparent watercolor, no. No, but 
No, the mm -hmm. TWSA. But Florida Watercolor. Yeah. I that used to be my job. I was on the board of the oh. Transparent Watercolor no, Society, you? and that was my job for two years. I was the the opaque Nazi. <laughs> I had to look at every painting as they came in, wow. and I had to detect if there was anything opaque on it. Wow. And sometimes it was watercolor, but it was painted so thick and opaque that it got rejected because <laughs> there was no transparency to it. So um, their rules are very specific and strict. And I'm not that way at all with what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm very whatever it takes kind of a thing. So I'm going to do a little bit more at the base of this one. Just with regular watercolor. I'm going into a beautiful color called Brown Stilda Grain, which my Mary discontinued. And I'm going to dry brush some stuff. In. Maybe I'll take it across that for now. Just taking my brush very perpendicular to give it that rough bottom that it has. That brown steel to grain, it's a beautiful golden, golden brown. And I was using it a lot in place of burnt sienna because the burnt sienna can be very a little bit chalky looking depending on the manufacturer and um and they discontinued it oh, so really yeah hmm. i don't know why I, I you know i just it's a beautiful color yeah. and it's transparent non-staining so it's like what's not to love about it yeah. and it and it worked great with with blues and i mean you could make beautiful mm. browns and grays and blacks with it that company discontinued it? Or? Yeah, they did. The, okay. the company discontinued it. Jeez. For whatever reason. I yeah. Didn't. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe that's it. <laughs> and maybe they couldn't get some of the um, the formula for it. You know, maybe they couldn't get some of the, the yeah, pigments. The all that could be, yeah. All that went into it. Well, I think I'm gonna hold it up. I'm gonna do one more thing to push these um, these trees, these little seedlings in the background further back. I'm gonna take a flat brush with no paint on it. And I'm just going to try to reactivate some of the color around it by going over it. And that's just enough to push that. Look at how it just subtly wow, pushed good. that back mm. just a little bit. Mm. So sometimes with the masking fluid, you don't need to soften it. You just need to take the color around it over the top of it. And now that really pushed those back in space because actually they shouldn't be the same white as the closest mm -hmm. trees that are to the picture plane. So I'm gonna go into this area and move mm -hmm. that back a little bit. So I don't have to add any more pigment. The color's already there. Do you ever dabble in anything besides watercolor? Um, well, I do do mixed media quite a bit. Um, I, with I'll, acrylics or? A little bit with acrylic, yeah, uh -huh. a little bit. And actually, I'm just starting to teach myself uh, oil painting. I did it in college, but you know, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, because I've been doing more plein air shows, <coughs> exhibits, oh. plein air competitions, mm -hmm. festivals, just in Oshkosh, where, I, where I'm from. And I've only done one other one in Oconomowoc. So um, I'm going to try to take this stuff off. So um, I don't know. I, I'm almost thinking, you know, I could, I've been doing them in watercolor. Um, and I've sold every single painting at all of them that I've been at so far. So it, it's going fine. But yet it seems like it lends itself to... Oil painting, that seems to be the traditional, what people want mm. at, at these competitions. But I've been thinking about it, and I'm like, well, why don't I just mix casein with my watercolor, you know, and put it on aqua board and seal it with a varnish, you know, then I wouldn't have to 
buy all that oil. <laughs> have have the mat and everything all ready to go and all of that. So um, I don't know. I'm thinking about it, but so I've been kind of working in my studio with some oil painting and. God, it's messy. Mm -hmm. Like like what we said about the acrylic, it's just messy. Yeah. So now I'm getting those little sparkles back with the white dabs of um, right. masking mm -hmm. fluid that I just kind of splattered on there. Do you have a favorite black, like a mixture of two colors? Yeah, yep, yep. I, I like to use Indigo's My Darkest Dark and I only use that for black. I rarely, I used to be so in love with indigo and it was in every painting and it was like the, the main event and, and, and then I kind of grew out of it. But I like to mix the indigo with that brown still to grain. It turns out, I'll, I'll, I'll mix it on the back of here for you to show you. So look at that nice little sparkle I'm getting. So often I, I tell my students, you don't have to paint every single inch of that paper. Leave some of the white of the paper. I think it's of the mm -hmm. utmost importance for watercolorists to leave that sparkle, because if you lose it, you can't get it back. So that's why I like to begin with a little bit of masking fluid, because I know for sure I'm gonna have some white left over somewhere, because <laughs> I'm, I'm sealing it right off the bat. So let me try to get these off the bottom here. So, it's, it's it is what it is, but she's a bad girl.